Shane Hayes, and coming up this week, I am joined by writer director Kyle Smith, director of Blue Highway and Turkey Bowl, to discuss Mike Lee and, in particular, the, his movie Topsy Turvy. Um, but first, what I watched this week, I'll keep this short. I really only watched one bizarre movie beyond the Mike Lee movies I was trying to catch up on um, for research or something I'm writing. Uh, this movie from 67 called Wild in the Streets, which was a deeply interesting movie. Um, and it was, it was fruitful for the research, I'll give it that. Uh, but it's about uh, this pop star, young pop star, who gets in uh, for the 68 election uh, th- through a series of events, eventually gets the voting age lowered uh, to four. I think 14 and uh, it, there was a, there's a fight over it. And uh, eventually the youth take over America and uh, it, it just hit all these right spots. But what I found really interesting about it is some of the policy uh, proposals they had were shockingly modern and have held up. I mean, besides the fact of voting, the, like, there's proposals out there to vote the lower the voter age to 16 right now. Um, but what ends up happening is uh, they force ret- in the movie they force retirement after the age of thirty, and they have to go. All old people over thirty have to go to these concentration camps where they're fed a lot of LSD. And uh, I'm an, um, a particular fan of the Michael Pollan book uh, How to Change Your Mind and uh, this the burgeoning science of psychedelics. How, uh, how promising it might be. Um, yeah, this movie. I'm not gonna lie, it wasn't good. It was. It's. I think it may be the first AIP movie I can remember seeing. Uh, and uh, the ending, the very last l- l- scene, uh, I could see Megan a real howler if you were watching it at a drive-in. Um, but uh, anyway, let's get on with the conversation with Kyle. <laughs> The story I was going to bring up also was the when I was at your apartment with the roommate was um, when you guys were showing the game show you guys were on. <laughs> oh yeah, going way back. Yeah, that's yeah. that's how I got my career started. Yeah, because uh, I remember like uh, so basically you went on a game show once a money and that is that the money you put in a turkey bowl? Yeah. So I I, I was uh, two thousand ten, two thousand nine, two thousand nine. I go on a game show that a one time episode show called crash course uh abc made it it was paired with their show wipeout they shot six episodes they only aired three mine never aired but i got a friend at abc who was able to get a a copy of it um and yeah we did stunt car driving for three days in detroit and won twenty five thousand dollars each and i used that money to pay for my first film turkey bowl (laughs) Which cost? Well, my, my my favorite part about the show is I forget the two hosts, but one of them was Orlando Jones, yeah. and he just like gave you this lecture on why you shouldn't spend your movie <laughs> money to make a movie. Yeah, he's at, uh, first of all, he's obviously right. Uh, the other host, <laughs> the other host for for just for posterity was Dan Cortese. Oh, Cortese, Dan Cortese, Cortese. Cortese. I always called him Dan Cortez, but it was you say it Cortese. I think. Really? I, I was going to say Dan Cortez. Yeah, he, that, he was That's very, the way I, they said him on MTV. They were very adamant about saying his name correctly. Uh, yeah, they were the two oh. hosts. And one of the weirdest things about being on that show, and I think about this when I watch reality shows, was we're driving in these cars, and we have, in one ear, we can hear those two guys, and in the other ear, we hear, like, directors telling us, like, what we should be talking about. And meanwhile, you're, like, dry, you're like getting ready to do this, like, dangerous stunt. So I remember... Um, them being like, you need to talk about MacGyver. We like said we like MacGyver. So they're like, talk about MacGyver. And meanwhile, uh, Cortez and Cortezzi and Jones are asking us silly questions. And and <laughs> I just had such empathy for actors in that moment of like being told <laughs> a million things and like, I can't, I'm just in this car. I have to like drive up this ramp. Um, 
but yeah, we uh, we won, yeah we won that. That was two thousand nine, and we got the money in twenty ten, and then uh, and then I was I used that to finance my first film, and uh, yeah, and then that kind of started my uh, my career, which is which is uh, a fun way to. It's a good story. It's crazy to think it's been ten years, but it's, yeah, ten years since that that went down. There's a guy on Letterboxd. I follow this guy named uh, Nashville Dude. Do you know this person on Letterboxd? No. He's one of those people. I I, I don't actually want to know. I think he's watched. <laughs> I think he's watched 2,100 movies this year. Watched and how logged. Do, how do you do that? He, he watches six movies a day. Every single day he watches six movies. It's, I think it's what the average is. Wasn't there a documentary about a guy that watched six, um, uh, came out two years ago about uh, theater goers, and it was uh, some guy in New York who was watching six movies a day? You, does this sound familiar? Vague, vaguely. I, I, I probably chose not to watch it because it would, sounds insane to me. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Either insane or there'd be certain things where it's like uh, um, hits too close to home. I remember in the trailer they had some like thing where uh, – the guy had uh, on speed dial the uh, box office to call whenever there was a theater uh, projection screw up. I mean, this I, I'm, I'm going to watch the most movies I've ever watched this year. I'm going to watch around 300, which will be I think uh, maybe in college okay. I may have watched I may have watched more. But I tend to find no matter what, I always cap out at like 220. It's like 220 is the sweet spot where I feel like I enjoy the movies. I take them in. I don't feel overwhelmed and I feel like my life is sort of functioning in other ways, uh, I, this person, I, I just, I simply am like, what are you doing? I, I, are you working? Like, how are you? Um, well, and how's your tension? Ten- do you span gamify for- how much? I have a thing where I do, I do, it's the one of the worst tendencies in my uh, movie going where it's like, I make it, it, it's an achievement. If I see a movie for the first time, like I, I do gamify the whole, like on letterbox, I can put in check off that I saw that movie, you know, or that I got my I, movie I t- in for the day or something like that. I go through I go through very intense actually Mike Lee is a great example. I go through very intense periods of like all right, I'm going to watch all like this summer I was like I want to finish all the major Ozu films, all the Mike Lee stuff and um and the major Mizuguchi. So I had this like Jeez. list of those okay. fi- those films. I got, no, I was I pretty got well so many Mizu- Mizuguchi, but um Ozu like I think actually all three of the people you mentioned I am so far behind on. It it was well they were appealing to the, I think I was working on and like thematically they were in line with what I, and I've always liked those movies, but it, for me, it was like real effort and I enjoyed the movies, but watching, like I watched all of Mike Lee's um, early BBC TV movies. And some of these are like, God, these are just not very good. Really? <laughs> you know? <laughs> yeah. A couple of them are very, we talked, Abigail's party is really great, obviously. Um, but like the, his first film is real bleak moments is like really, I found hard watching. Uh, that and, was that was like a feature feature though that wasn't a BBC play yeah right? it was not a BBC yeah his first mm-hmm. and then the second one Hard Labor I think is I think is BBC but it got like a limited theatrical okay and all of those are on, all of those are on film except for Abigail's Party which is the one that like I think you mentioned uh, we, Louis C.K. one of the uh, um um, past guests, uh, uh, we used to have a movie club with uh, one of the past uh, guest hosts, uh, Lon- Lonnie Gonzalez, and a few of our friends. And that was my pick, but it was a pick because like I'd never seen it. And um, we, we, get, I don't know if we should go. In, we can go into it now. Um, I got into it just because. Did you see any of uh, Louis C.K.'s thing, Horse and Pete? Yeah, that that was. Yeah, I watched the whole. I loved it. I watched the whole thing. I think I. <sighs> It, it hits a sweet spot of what makes me want to like Mike Lee more and get more into Mike Lee just because, like, I have this obsessive thing with uh, playwrights becoming filmmakers. And also there was some cool stuff in Horace and Pete where, like, it felt like it was written weekly, even though it was a thing that, that like, you know, was br- was blended and br- kind of thought over for a long period of time, fermented. And, like... I don't know. There's also just a lack of fussiness on how it was shot. Like it was just like get some actors, d- shoot a play, kind of, but like a sit, but not exactly like a sitcom. You know, like it's but it still feels cinematic. It's still not well, not cinematic, but you know, like it, it's. I I think there's something about getting more uh, good performances and good drama in an immediacy way that that had an appeal to it. And anyway, Louis C.K. said that one of the inspirations for this was. Abigail's party. So we showed that that and um, for for my my impressions of Horse and Pete, I love I love it a lot, except for like the last ten minutes where like the very very end makes it suddenly community theater ish. And Abigail's party, like I had, I don't know, I I, I don't I, I couldn't figure out the tone of it when I was watching it. 
It's funny, as as I said, I loved Horse and Pete. I was like, wait, 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 I actually, I did not like the last couple episodes <laughs> as I thought about it. What well, was the um, ending? It was this, like, the very last thing that happened ruined the whole show, almost. I, I It's one of those things where I, I actually, and this is the thing about me generally, and this might come up as we talk, I have a, um, you know, there's a great line in, in sports, especially for, like, quarterbacks, like, mm-hmm. having a short having a short memory, like, mm. you threw an interception, like, forget about it, right, move right, on. right. Uh, I have sort of a short memory with movies and it's part of why I use Letterboxd so much. It's so I can really remember like scenes or, or, or moments and things because I will sort of forget, which is a gift because when I rewatch them, oh my God, this is amazing. I totally forgot what happens in this movie. Mm. But at the same time, um, I have trouble sometimes accessing uh, specific thoughts in movies. But so this is going to come up Pete- also later on uh, Topsy Turvy just because like I had to rewatch the last hour again after going over my notes because I was like, I don't remember anything I wrote in my notes. It's part of the magic and the frustration of the movie, I think, is like it, it it's a time. Well, we'll get, we'll get to it. Okay. Like, okay, okay. like what is going on in Topsy Turvy? Um, okay, okay. But Horse Pete, for me, Horse and Pete, that, when I think about that show, I just think about the Laurie Metcalf. Uh, monologue that opens like the third or fourth episode. Oh my god! But it's like, um, was it half of the episode or the entire? It, ep- almost the it's entire- it's something. It's one of those things where it feels like it's half, and I think it's actually like eight minutes, but it feels like it's twenty minutes. You know, I think some people with long takes and virtuosic filmmaking, and I'm making air quotes. Uh, you know, <laughs> they like think it's long. Actually, there's a shot in Topsy Turvy when Gilbert and Sullivan first meet that feels like it's five minutes and it's three. Mm. But it feels like, wow, that, that's like a whole a whole thing. Um, or when they first meet in the film, rather. Their first uh, meet, so, is, that, is that their first meeting scene? Like, Yeah, the, when he goes, I think Gilbert goes to Sullivan's like the, they office. Have, they have the, the, the candy at that one point. Uh-huh. I watched, yeah, yeah. I watched some of the, uh, the featurette and that was like the first clip they showed in the featurette from 99 when the movie came out. He, uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a lovely scene for a lot of reasons. But, um, I think your your mind gets uh, when you think of these those long takes, they feel like they're more than they actually, you know. When you watch Touch of Evil, the first shot's only three or and a half or four and a half minutes, but in your mind, it's like, whoa, it's a full reel, you know, or something. Yeah. <laughs> and I don't think it's that long. I could be maybe I could be wrong about yeah, Touch of Evil. It, but, al- um, it always goes to that vibe that sometimes when a movie's really working, even or film make, people like us like bu- they have to con- concentrate on how a movie's made. There's this vibe still that hits me this day that I think a movie's being made up on the spot when I'm really into it, even when I'm trying to think of how it's being made. Well, I think that's one of the great Mike Lee things is that they have this feeling of at their best moments they feel a little bit like they're just sort of happening. Mm-hmm. Um, okay. Which again we can get we can get to that because I think there's a conversation to be had about um, and maybe we can you know whatever but like how um, in Topsy Turvy there's like a realism going on, there's a historical accuracy going on, and there's this like improvisational spirit all kind of meeting to create these like alchemic moments that are hard to, um, like I just, I think I'm loving it because I'm so like, what, how is this made? I don't understand how this movie got made. <laughs> um, like literally like the day-to-day like production of it and the seriousness of everyone involved, like I don't, um, I can't like wrap my head around it. And I think movies like that tend to keep me coming back for more. Do we want to go? Okay. Do, let's go into um, Mike Lee. So Mike Lee is a playwright who became a filmmaker and a lot of his style uh, supposedly involves a lot of, he, he, the scripts are made through a long process of improvisation. Although it doesn't seem like, it seems like, I mean, you just held up a, a, a screenplay for, for this movie like it seems like the improvisation is to write something like you know second city style and then they actually shoot what they've written it's not like they're improvising on the day yeah i mean i i i would never claim to be an expert on this especially because lee himself seems to give conflicting reports and so does dick pope in that uh on his his appearance on roger deakins podcast about how lee works cuz i always was told oh he improvises everything everything's made up mm-hmm. and and then i watched these i remember watching um like Secrets and Lies when I was younger and I was like, no, this is, even then I was like, this is not, they're not making, I've seen improv. This is not improv. <laughs> this is, this is very well uh, constructed and um, rehearsed and like things are, the way things are covered and shot. So my understanding, and it, I have a book, uh, a lovely book called Mike Lee on Mike Lee interviews with um, Amy Raphael is the, is the writer who does, she has okay. a great introduction and then she does a series of interviews with him. And throughout, he does this thing where he, he's like, my pro- he's a little bit like my process you can't really understand it but here I'll try you know <laughs> like he's constantly uh... like telling you he's constantly saying things like you can't really get it but here's like a sense um, 
which is a little, uh, to use a phrase of his, a little, uh, little cheeky. Um, I think he does it on purpose because I, I tend to defer to him. But my understanding is he does three to six months of rehearsals with actors, developing characters, um, using a lot of the sort of key things seem to be, think of people you know. Think about, um, you know, your, I don't know, your, your fifth grade teacher. or Think about the, your first boss or, like, or someone who in your life who you can draw human feelings from and maybe combine that with someone else. Combine it with your mother. And this is a standard acting thing. Okay. Uh, and then they build the character based on that. And Lee has something of a framework in most of his movies, especially in something like Topsy Turvy or Vera Drake um, or Secrets and Lies. Uh, where he has like a vague conceptual idea. And then they work through improv, which is done in costume, which he mentions that in Topsy Turvy, they were doing improv in costume. Um, so they had... That's assistant... notable. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the, so he's like, everyone is... Uh, they had assistant directors at the rehearsal space dressing everybody. I assume they did the same on Mr. Turner and Peter Lou, which is really something to think about. Um, hmm. And and there's some kind of physicality. He doesn't really say what his games are uh in fact, in the interview book, he talks about the play, the man who plays um, uh, Gilbert's father, Charles Simon, was eighty nine, and I, I actually I took I wrote some things down here, um, but he he describes that one of the uh, that guy quote, had an interesting shake to him. Yeah, well, he he died and he died shortly after the movie. Oh, um, so was that a real shake then? Yeah, might 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 have been. He doesn't Ooh. address that for probably good reason. Mm-hmm. But the quote the quote from Lee about that is he says, "quote I do a lot of abstract stuff where people crawl around on their hands and knees," and he Charles Simon did all of that. Um, so I assume there's some kind of dark physicality to what uh, uh, mm-hmm. what's going on to develop these characters. But they then work on scenes. They rehearse scenes. And then Lee basically transcribes those scenes, and that's the script. And okay. then he's a, and then he's a pretty, in, I think he follows that script pretty intensely. But it also seems to vary from movie to movie how much he follows it. Like on, um, I mean, I have a screenplay here of Topsy Turvy, but I think it's, in some sense, it's just a document that might be written like based on what happens in the movie. Um, it, one the I, the internet phenomenon of like uh, not posting the script but posting the transcript of the finished movie. I hate that shit. This, I mean, this is written, like, clearly Lee or someone, like, there's stage directions that are lovely and whatnot, um, and the and the the songs are cited and all this stuff. Like, it's clearly something, I have a feeling what happened was they wanted to, um, USA Films or whoever released this was like, uh, we want to push you for Oscars, and so maybe you can get Best Screenplay, so we need to have, like, a published screenplay. Um, He's been nominated for Best Screenplay for a bunch of his movies, right? Yeah, and I, I assume a version of this is what's kicked out, um... Mm. I always think one year a friend of mine got the uh, screenplay for The Master and it mm-hmm. was like uh, such a sloppy, almost like first draft with like multiple scenes that weren't in the movie. <laughs> there, and... there was a leaked version of that, I remember, because it was like Untitled Scientology Project or whatever I think it was. I mean, the version that like that, uh, was that, um, who released that one? Was that, uh, it wasn't Warner Brothers. Uh, no, they did Inherent Vice. Um, anyway, whoever, whoever... Anyway. Uh, I should know. Who, I have whatever. Whoever <laughs> did the push for that, um, they sent out a script with like full of typos and missing scenes and things that weren't shot, and it was sort of amazing to be like, "Oh, Paul Thomas Anderson is." Didn't a it even messy have filmmaker. some like slugs to like scene to be uh, determined later, or some bracketed scenes where it's like this? Yeah, and then of course it didn't win. I don't think it even got nominated. <laughs> Maybe it did, mm-hmm. um, but uh, it is funny to consider what a screenplay is. But anyway, so to get. Uh, rambling on here so so lee generally works in that way where they rehearse and then everyone is aware of the story they're going to tell um what gets tricky is in some of his films he uh in the rehearsals period he likes to withhold information make it so characters don't meet other characters that's what i was going to ask the next doesn't he like to not tell people their fates or where the character's going to end in the movie exactly yeah most famously there's a sequence in vera drake that is sort of talked about where the, the movie's about a, a woman who performs abortions and the character playing her husband did not know that until they did a improv or did a scene in the rehearsal process and the police knocked on the door to arrest her uh arrest her in the in the in the rehearsal or in mm-hmm. the improv i guess um and so that is when that actor learned that he was in a movie about a woman who performs abortions what's interesting is that it's not he's Jesus, not filming that's that that's awesome yeah, I, and it's and so oh god, I, Tony, that actor is. Um, oh, I haven't seen Vera Drake, so. Oh uh, well, 
It's about, no, no, it's, no, it's, it's, it's fine. It's, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a mild spoiler, but it happens about halfway through. I think everyone knows that movie's about abortion. Yeah, no, um, I, knew, yeah I knew what the movie's about. Um, but she, not everyone, <laughs> I'm not sure if Vera Drake uh, was a cultural phenomenon the way it should have been. <laughs> uh, but he, uh, yeah, so he creates, and then what's interesting though, like a lesser director, I remember when I first heard that story, I was like, oh, man, he should have been filming that and like captured that moment in a, in a reel on set. And um, Lee's like not that cheap. That's like a bit of a cheap trick to sort of, uh, mm. trick an actor he does it in the improv with the idea that the actor w- will sort of take that surprise and that feeling and i think he lee believes that that will carry over to the performance so mm, even sense. when the actor went through that shock he could then draw on that shock for um for when they actually shoot the movie with costumes and lights and the whole you know the I was, of production i was thinking of uh have you ever heard the story about the end of broadcast news where they shot in sequence and like james l brooks couldn't figure out who who uh holly hunter should end up with and so um one idea was that they um they were going to ha- shoot an ending where she ended up with william hurt and they were going to improv it where he just got into the cab with her and uh they got ready to shoot that day and was going to surprise her on film doing it and uh, somebody on set spoiled it right before they were about to shoot. I I just watched that movie. I had no idea. Yeah. That, and he so 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 someone spoiled it so they couldn't get this. Th- that magical scene shot. is still on the Criterion. The because uh, they tried to, they went ahead and filmed and they tried to see if they would work. And I mean I, that movie is so amazing, but that movie clearly just like. It gets so it's so good that it's like it's bigger than like who does she end up with, but at the same time the movie still focuses on who she ends up with. But yeah, that, yeah I mean that movie in many ways James L. Brooks those first few films is kind of an American Mike Lee in some regard. I mean they're totally different, but they're, I think their interests are so character driven. Mm-hmm. And okay. um, I mean I'm kind of spitballing on this idea, but if you look at Terms of Endearment and um, uh, in broadcast news, uh, both those movies are set in like sort of universe. And broadcast news, especially, has so much about filmmaking and behind the scenes stuff that's playing into the characters, which is uh, so much of what um, uh, Topsy Turvy is about. However, James L. Brooks definitely has melodrama uh, in his veins, and yeah. that's not really there for Lee. But I don't know who else you kind of compare to him. I mean, it's like he's like the Hollywood Mike Lee, and Mike Lee's never been <laughs> well, <laughs> never go Hollywood. I mean, I, I mean, Kubrick was big into like w- when he would improvise. Like it was like we improvise, we write it down, and then we record or then we film it. Very, very much. Um, Scorsese obviously is a was a has created a lot of stuff through improv, but I think it's in a similar vein where it was like the improv was for the writing itself. But um, one thing about Topsy Turvy that really struck me, and I don't know if it's just the fact that it's period language. But it doesn't strike me as that improv phase. Well, that's yeah, and I think that's why I, I think that's why this was such a touchstone of I, I, I was always confused at how I could hear about how Mike Lee made movies, and then he made this period film where you cannot improvise with like sets that are immaculately designed and costumes, and mm. you, you don't have that freedom, right? Right. So I think this was a this Vera Drake and 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 Mr. Turner and Peter Lou, all of which are his like kind of period films. Um, the the idea behind them how he, how he made them really interested me um and he i mean he talks about like i think the second to last shot of the movie with um i forget the actress's name the woman who's um in the white bridal gown um she's talking in the mirror i think that was like an improvisation okay uh, or that scene, I forget which. I, I, again, we just watched, I just watched the movie like two hours ago. I already can't, can't remember. Uh, yeah. But she's talking. She's talking to herself in the mirror, and I think he says that that is a uh, that is a version of improvisation where they could set her up. She knew her character. They had a shot. It was simple. It was designed to like let the character breathe in that moment, and it was good enough to make it into the movie. I think that's okay. the extent with which he might improvise on set. But other than that, I think the characters are doing the actors are doing deep research into who they're playing. And um, in fact, in the Lee book, he talks about how they knew a lot about Gilbert. They knew a decent amount about Sullivan. But for example, Richard Temple, the character that Timothy Spall plays, they that's a real person, but they didn't know much about him. So okay. Timothy Spall is sort of uh, inventing the character himself through, based on like historical things, what he can read, what he can gather about the guy's performances. Um, and the actor's doing a lot of work to then really be... like I imagine this is like a, a room of Daniel Day-Lewis's 
where everyone is calling each other by their <laughs> by their names. And and Lee describes it as work as like they go in like at ten AM and they're there till six, like five days a week for like six months. That, so when they when they come out of it, they are and that's the why rehearsals no, are that intensive. Yeah, I mean in his words, it's like they're doing at least six to eight hours a day. Like it's I a was, job. I was just listening to someone t- re-describe uh, the way uh, Sidney LeMay describes um, his rehearsal process and making movies, and they were just like, yeah, no one could do that anymore. That's impossible. And LeMay was only doing like two weeks, three weeks, I think. Well, and it's part of why Lee doesn't work with like American actors, really. I mean, not that he needs to, but um, he keeps his stable of actors because they know his working process. And mm, okay. you can kind of see when people pop into a movie and then they're not in them anymore. You can kind of be like, oh, that's interesting. <laughs> um, but like mm-hmm. famously, David Thewlis, or two, I never want to say it, Thewlis, right? Uh, David Thewlis has a Thuelis. brief... Thewlis? Thewlis, yeah. Uh, that's how I've always heard it pronounced. I really don't know how to say his name. There's a bunch of these names here. I'm, gonna, I'm not good with French. Come on, go it's fine. Anything. Um, people, will, they'll forgive you. They'll forgive me. Yeah, I got to apologize in some way. Uh, he is in a very brief, he's a brief, very brief role in Life is Sweet. And then he was upset that he got kind of cut out of the movie because he shot a mm-hmm. bunch. But then for whatever, and he, and he did the full rehearsal process, he shot a bunch, then they kind of wouldn't on his character out in the edit. So as sort of a mea culpa, he made Naked, um, which then gave Thulis a, a chance to really shine. Um, and then, But then Thulis has not really reappeared, right? I'm, I'm looking actually at the, at the filmography here. I'm not sure he's in anything after Naked, but maybe that's because he didn't need to be. reasons I, i'm really happy that i want to do the show and have friends on to like pick a movie first for me to watch is a lot of times one okay i i betrayed this on the last episode i, I kind of screwed up because i was talking about mank and uh, i was talking about i liked mank overall and thought it was entertaining but i kind of said some bad things about it and i had originally had the philosophy on the show that came from david fincher that i had heard through a essay aaron sorkin wrote about him where he makes a point not to criticize movies because in public or in um in posterity just because he knows movies are hard to make and uh so you know mike lee is in i don't know how i feel about mike lee like especially because i I wanted to go into a deep dive before we did this and the only movie i ended up watching besides topsy turvy was naked and it was the first time i'd seen it and i have a group of friends that have at different times pitched me like um Mike Lee's this movie is one of the greatest movies of all time. And someone had a few years ago had told me Naked is one of the greatest their their favorite movies of all time. And I did not have a good time with Naked. And the thing is, like Dwellis' performance is is unimpeachably great. I'm not denying that, but it seems like that's the reason for the movie. And a lot of the problems I had was the improvisational style. Like it really like it felt like it, I, it started to remind me stuff that was happening in Abigail's party and in Naked, where the tension I'm feeling, the dramatic tension I'm feeling in scenes is this improvisational thing where the actors need to keep the scene interesting and going. And like, there's a tedium that came from it afterwards. I don't know. And uh, Naked, I don't know. Yeah. Despite you not liking the movie. Or, or I like Topsy Turvy. Your... I did like Topsy Turvy, though. Well, I and, and I, I, I. It's my second time seeing it. And I agree with I, I agree fundamentally with the idea that um, I try I, I try to like even my whole approach to movies is that they're all I mean they're all they're all gifts to us they're all amazing things right uh, sometimes a movie can frustrate or insult me and, and maybe I'll I won't like it then but you know with Mike Lee or, or giving filmmaker like him I, I even the sports films I still like I just might get bored what was your favorite scene in Naked if you had to pick a favorite scene or favorite sequence. Uh, probably his breakdown at the end. I, I don't know, because, I mean, like, a lot a lot of problems I had were a lot of modern reading on it, because it feel, felt like uh, I was watching uh, men being abusive to women, and the filmmakers, like, it, it didn't, it seemed like it was, they were they were happy how edgy it seemed, and, like, that that kind of, I, I, I have too much of a very current reading on that, as opposed mm-hmm. to what it was like to watch it then. There was that, um... I I I, I asked because I really do you enjoy the scene with the security guard? Sure, yeah. That's like my that's like to me that's I, I'm with you. I, naked is not I don't put naked in the pantheon of Lee. It's a little like okay. um, for me. I have I have several others I like more than Naked, including what I think is the inverse of it uh, in a much better film is Happy Go Lucky, 
I have uh, another friend who has hap- who ha- having watched Happy Go Lucky, and and the thing is, I remember liking it, and like we were describing earlier, I don't remember a fucking thing about the movie beyond the central performance. Th- and I think those films speak to each other in a way where it's like they're both character studies, and yeah, one's about a pessimist and one's about an optimist, but there's just as much darkness in Happy Go Lucky, I would argue, um, and the way that Sally Hawkins' character handles it is is just way more um, okay. Uh, interesting and and appealing um, am i she, am i reading something weird into finding a clockwork orange vibe to naked or an uh, alex uh, uh, at least the malcolm mcdowell vibe to it yeah maybe uh yeah, I, I watched naked during uh, this i watched it this year um i did a thing where i watched a lot of my D, uh dvds and blu-rays with commentary tracks so uh mm-hmm. i wanted to like Peru, like go through. I don't know why I want to go back. To no, like good being, on you. I, I, it's a practice I've, I haven't. I used to. It was a great background practice, and I haven't been doing it as much lately. It can be. Years. It can feel daunting, weirdly, and then when you put them on, they're so therapeutic. And oftentimes, like naked, is much more enjoyable <laughs> with Mike Lee talking about it. Yeah, it, I, I feel this. Have you ever seen uh, Linklater's very first movie, uh, the one before Slacker? It's impossible uh, it's to impo- plow by. Yeah, it's impossible to plow by learning or reading, by, learning, by reading, reading books. Books, yeah. It's, it's on the, impossible it's on the to learn how to plow by reading books. Yes. The commentary is the only way to watch that movie because the movie itself is just, you know, it's whatever. It's, I kind of like experimental. I kind of like that movie because it's so um, embryonic of what Linklater at the time thought a mo- the movie he should make, he, the kinds of films he should make should be. Uh-huh. And then he like found his way into what he just rocks at. Uh, mm-hmm. I love Linklater. Um, yeah, me too. The, but yeah, so, so I, I asked because that sequence in Naked with the, um, with the uh, security guard, I think it's some of the most visually striking stuff in any of Mike Lee's. It feels like the most cinematic. There's all those shots of like the lights are on in a dark building and these guys are like talking about philosophy and different ideas. And the movie f- seems to sort of digress in a way that I, I find really uh, fascinating. Um, Do you consider him going across the street as part of that sequence? Uh, what is he? <laughs> can, we can do this a lot go- today. He, he goes, goes to. He goes to the girl. The, they're looking at the girl across the street, and then he goes in yes. and seduces the girl across the street. Yes, I'm. I'm leaving that part out. Yes, sorry, that is not okay. for me. It's the it's the sequence when him and the guy are talking, uh, the security guard, and okay. on the commentary, Lee talks about that security guard. I, I think either the character or the man's name is Brian. I think it's actually the actor's name is is named Brian, uh, something, and he talks about this guy committing completely to that role of that security guard, like worked with security guards, put nights in at a bank. Like did all this stuff to be as authentic as possible for that little part that to me is the richest part of the movie. And sometimes with Lee, and as we were talking earlier about like you're doing six months of maybe six months of, of 40 hour rehearsal weeks, the question is like, is it worth it? Like if you love Topsy Turvy. Are you trying I, to mine gold out of this? Yeah, like is it is this like is that is that a better movie than um a film that took you know three weeks to shoot, and I did two weeks of rehearsals. You know, like it's mm. is the is the is the is Lee's process uh, so valuable to create like lasting works of art um, that it's worth like I mean I I don't even know how you pay people. How do you get an actor like Leslie Manville and say, hey, I need you for six months to not take a job because I need you to be rehearsing to then be in this movie where maybe I'll cut you out because we're going <laughs> to go a different, different way. I, um, it's a really uh, sort of aggressive. Cause and, it's uh, a fluid screenplay that you're working on. Yeah. Yeah. Um, um, something that you and I are familiar with, obviously <laughs> based yeah. on our past yeah. <laughs> experiences. So I sometimes the question for me is often like, what is, the, is this, is all this work worth it for the films he makes? And I find generally it is. Um, that's interesting and, that you didn't like. Apparently, Nick. the actors are loving the performances enough to do that to commit to this. Oh, and they're, and they're dying to work with him. They say until they a lot of them like actually encounter what his method is like. Mm. Um, but the guy, the people that do, I mean, you look you look at um, Manville or Broadbent or his wife, his ex wife Allison Stedman, who is in Topsy Turvy briefly, um, and she's in Abigail's Party. She plays. Uh, this is around the period they divorced, isn't it? I think they divorced in the eighties, actually. I think she oh. worked. I think she's in Life is No. Is she in Life is Sweet? She might, she's okay. in High Hopes, I think, which is the film before that. Okay. Um, maybe maybe I'll edit that for you later. <laughs> but <laughs> yeah, she they divorced and they kept working together. They had kids, kids and, and whatnot. Um, but yeah, even after that, they still she would still be in his films because I guess the for an actor, 
like having known and worked with actors myself and you, you, you as well, um, there's something that I think a lot of actors, it's so cliche. I'm trying, it's so cliche. I'm trying to describe it the right way. Like the theater is somehow more important than movies, even still. Like there's something mm. pure about the theatrical experience and, and, and being in front of people. And I, I, I am not an actor. I can't stand being in front of people, uh, making stuff up. Um, it is, uh, it, I did an improv class years ago and it was like the worst nine weeks of my life. Mm. <laughs> uh, but I learned a lot, obviously, uh, but it was very difficult for me. But I think actors still like that. And I think Lee creates that environment for them where they can feel like they're really developing something and then it's recorded and shot and executed beautifully and creates a work of art that like does last. So, okay. Um, what, all right. I, I don't remember seeing this movie the first time. I, I think I watched it on my, uh, my dad's VCR in 99 after it came out. It was a uh, Roger Ebert's number nine movie uh, in his top 10 in 1999. He said it's one of the best movies about life in the theater. And, um, Rewatching it as much as I didn't, I had problems with Naked. I did find this movie very charming, and I was glad. And it was a good suggestion. I'm glad you made it. Um, one notable thing I did have with it, though, is that it felt like the first 45 minutes or hour was a very extended first act prologue to where the movie then took off when the like they actually started on the play or started on the actual the show itself, and like. Um, did you? When did you first see this movie? I saw this movie when it came out. I would have been fifteen. Um, I don't think I got it. So you okay? That was my that was my big question because I, I feel like there's a difference between seeing this movie before I worked on a movie and seeing it after I worked on a movie. There was this feeling of like the infectiousness of let's all put on a show. Like that was the charm for me at least. Yeah, I, I mean. <sighs> So I watched it then, and I, I think I was like, oh, it's okay. And, and I, at some point, if, you know, as soon as you watch movies, and if someone asks you, if you I think probably if you asked me in 2010 if I'd seen uh, Topsy Turvy, I'd have been like, no. Because my memory <laughs> my memory of it was so gone. And then I watched it, um, like I think probably two or three years ago, and I really liked it. And uh, actually, my girlfriend, it's one of her favorite movies, and she... Um, we were watching it and she was singing along to the songs mm. and I was like, are you a Gilbert and Sullivan person? And she's like, no, I just have seen this movie so many times that it's, it's like in me. Does um, she know any other Gilbert and Sullivan? No, no. I mean, she only wow. knows the songs in the movie. Wow. The, the, the three Merry Maids and the, and, and, yeah, the, and yeah. the Timothy Spall, you know, all that stuff. She like was humming the, and singing the songs, knowing the words. And it struck me then that the movie could be like a, it's a bit of like a hangout movie in a lot of ways. Uh, you I can see, see that. I can see that. It's like a, like a Linklater term. Um, and so, yeah, I watched it then, and that kind of kick-started my interest in Lee when I saw this and was really into it. And then I revisited it uh, the beginning of this year. I watched it again, and then, I, of course, I watched it again today. And it, it – you mentioned earlier it was um, – I was being – today, with because I, I acquired the screenplay a few months ago, and I hadn't really read it yet. So I was actually watching the movie and reading the script at the same time to sort of like – Do you do that? No, almost never. Uh, okay. In fact, I don't think I've ever done it. Uh, but I was trying to intuit some kind of... I think I wanted to see what he was doing. Um, I had a habit for a while of... Uh, it's really helpful with Coen Brothers movies where I would watch the movie and read the screenplay after. That, I, that I've done before. I don't think I'd ever... I mean, I was literally like watching 20 minutes at a time and then like pausing it and reading the script. Hmm. Um, which, as I mentioned, is, a, is basically a transcript of the movie. I'm not sure how much of this favor and favor screenplay is actually mm -hmm. the screenplay but even so it was still helpful and i saw the structure of the movie a little more which you alluded to it's like the first hour is um the story like a friendship story of gilbert and sullivan giving them to the mikado getting gilbert to see the uh japanese exhibition that kind of gives him the the aha moment the sword falling which is a uh, uh an apocryphal story that maybe inspired him to write the play and and then at that point, the movie totally changes and becomes just like a like a really lovely backstage drama about artists collaborating and working together. And um, you know, I, I, there's a there's a featurette on the Criterion DVD where Lee says something that I wrote down. Uh, he says, uh, "I want to make a film about quote we who slave ourselves to death and go to hell and back to make profound trivia for the laughing public." <laughs> 
one quote that's been going in my brain lately it was from our uh, our uh, old co-worker mark yoshikawa he um uh when he had to do an epk he used a, a dolly parton quote that said it takes a lot of work to look this trashy which <laughs> this movie's all about the work it takes to look that silly what i think as filmmakers ourselves and also as people interested in movies we have a natural we can't help but think all movies are somehow about filmmaking or like you want to like take that angle. Mm. Not all movies, but oftentimes a film that feels impenetrable or feels um, anything about performance or, uh, you know, they, they, they reflect back on the filmmaker and Lee is very upfront that that's what this movie is doing for him. He, he is using it to examine like what the filmmaker is doing and the effort that goes into making things. And I think it's why so many of the joyous scenes in the movie, like there's the scene where Sullivan is playing the piano with the three or four gentlemen in the room and they're singing along as he plays. It's that just like was a, a favorite scene. That was really good. It, when and, he's, when he starts getting into the, uh, uh, the triplets of the pronunciation that just like, Oh, the language. Oh man. And, and, and another thing about this movie too, is that the historical, um, accuracy in it is, is on an, is on a breathtaking level. Uh, um, yeah. Yeah, this was something I didn't really understand until I watched the commentary and I read, <laughs> read a book about Mike Lee. But um, you my, fair, my favorite part about this is that uh, there is one mistake in the movie, which is uh, Sullivan makes a comment about, um, and I, I forget this sometimes, but Gilbert is the writer, Sullivan is the composer. Sullivan makes a comment I about... I get confused. I get that so confused. Yeah, I don't know how... I, I finally kind of got it now, but it's like Gilbert writes Sullivan... Uh, maybe maybe think words Gilbert first and Sullivan second. Um, mm. Sullivan for sound. Maybe that's it. Sullivan for sound. Mm. Uh, he says something about um, if you want to write. It, Gilbert says I'd like to write a play about uh, a prostitute uh, or whatever. Or Sullivan says maybe you should go write a play about a prostitute who um, uh, you know is struggling, a waif who's dying on the streets. And Gilbert says, oh, that would be uh, we should ask our friend Ibsen back in Oslo. I remember that line. And so. Mike Lee, he talks about it in his book multiple times. He talks about it multiple times in the commentary, and he's talked about it in interviews. At the time the film is set, Oslo was actually called Christiana. It was not, it was not called Oslo. He, he, I thought it was going to be something Ibsen related. <laughs> no, no. It, he, re, he refers to it as a howler. He calls it like his, his language about this mistake is, is, is as if like someone – it's almost like he made like a racist comment. He like truly – seems to not get past this Oslo, Christiana. And, and to me, it's like, well, if you said Christiana, I wouldn't have known what you were talking about. You know, uh, I wouldn't. Sure. I'm not, Although I, that seems like one of those details that they'd obsess over to the confusion and consternation of the viewer. Like, we got it right. We, we covered our ass, but, but no you one knows what it is. No one knows what it is. Uh, and, and, maybe I, and so much of the movie is the language is so difficult, but I think they did a lot of study of how people talked, words they use, phrases they use. There's all mm. kinds of little things of history. Like there's a bit early in the film where they talk about the Churchills coming back from Ireland and young and Winston. The, uh, 11 year old uh, Winston is a, uh, uh, what he uh, uh, allergic to authority or whatever the line is. Yeah. It's like, there's little, and, and I guess I also not being British. I don't, first of all, I don't have a huge attraction to Victorian era stuff, but Lee, this isn't that long ago. And I think some of the things the yeah. movie does is to say like, look, there's a telephone in this movie. Like there are, um, you know, if you were born when this film, film was made, you're like in your 60s, you're, you're Winston Churchill, you know, mm -hmm. you're then of, a, of age during World War II. Um, and I think he does a lot of things to kind of tie Victorian stuff into England. I just am not versed enough in like Anglic uh, culture to like know what that means or feels like, but mm -hmm. it seems like a direct thing in the film. And they were just incredibly obsessive about uh, every detail. And they it won, it won Oscars for makeup and costume. And I think it lost production design to Sleepy Hollow, of all things. Um, Sleepy Hollow is a well-production design it, it, movie. It is definitely a great movie. But it's, it's funny to think that that's like what's, what this was competing against. <laughs> it's just like how silly are awards. Um, so um, you said the, your Lee rewatch was this year? I watched I this year I watched the things I was missing. So I mostly watched the BBC films, the early films he made. Okay. And a handful of stuff. Um, to me, there's kind of like two eras of Lee, and the film Meantime is the midpoint. Uh huh. Um, which was I think a B, was a BBC film, but uh, was like I good, did like, I, I did want to ask you about Nuts and May the because uh, Edgar Wright's apparently a big fan of it. Yeah, N Nuts and May is. The, this seems like the big films from his 
early period are Abigail's Party, which we've discussed, the sort of television um, sitcom shot film uh, based on a play starring his wife, Alison Sedman, and Nuts and May, which um, my understanding of Nuts and May was it was a BBC film that... It's just, this is one of those things that you miss about like the monoculture a little bit. Maybe we miss living in America is uh, in these in 2020, which is um, things that would air on television and everyone would see them. Like I f- feel like for people okay. our age, it's like the, how the Grinch stole Christmas, the animated version, or sure. uh, okay. those other Christmas things, or um, uh, the Ten Commandments airing every Easter. I think an equivalent in, in the UK was Nuts in May. The way it aired when it was made, it, 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 the BBC ran it like once or twice and everyone watched it. And it like became like a real touchstone for a lot of filmmakers and people in England. That movie has like a huge reputation um, in the it's UK. Like the, it's like the, I don't know, Day After or Roots for yeah, America. Yes, yes. I think that's a great example. Like I think that this, no one today really knows about the Day After, but that was a, of course that had a, such a, uh, political um, uh, uh, have thing. you seen yeah. the day after it's it is uh, yeah well, I've seen, I, sorry go ahead I've seen, I've seen like the famous sequence the like uh, when the bomb hits or whatever yeah I had a we had Nicholas Meyer on an earlier episode and I and I find that movie brutal but anyway Well, it's the reason I asked about the uh, the Mike Lee. I'm curious, foundationally, what is Mike Lee like? Is okay. Your movie Turkey Bowl, like that's with how much improv was in that, and how much foundationally do you put Mike Lee into that, into what, into your films? Well, I think that was part of what I uh, maybe responded to with Lee, which I at that time I basically hadn't seen any Mike Lee. I'd only seen Secrets and Lies and. Uh, topsy turvy so, when I was when I was like not a child. at all then basically yeah okay and I was probably like you know I was quite young uh, my my film Turkey Bowl we um, we shot in uh, the the kind of quick parts of it we shot in ten days story order one location people playing a game of football to kind of describe the movie for for people and um, I cast is, it, people. is this still available yeah um, weirdly stream? it's it's back out on this a funny thing happens when you make movies sometimes you like are unaware of how they're available. Uh, I believe it's now on Amazon Prime. Cool. Um, okay. And I, think I, I saw it on Netflix. It's, yeah. I yeah. It, it, I think it got a new. It, uh, someone reached out to me, and I said sure. And and like a, like a year and a half ago, and of course now it's available again. Um, so I get like whiffs of how it comes back out. Uh, but we, the way I, I since I shot in story order, it gave me the freedom to let things develop in certain ways. And I told everyone to kind of base the characters in the film go by their own names. And I told them if things develop or you feel a thing that goes a certain way, let's follow that and we'll shoot that and we'll go that way. But there was a screenplay, a very, very boring screenplay with a lot of like football directions and you know, <laughs> okay. play calls and stuff like that. And we did follow that script through. But like, for example, I remember there was a scene where um, like a play wasn't working or a scene wasn't working. And so we were like, let's just change it to a an incompletion. And then you're frustrated about that. And then we'll follow that angle. And that happened probably, you know, not a ton of times, probably like a dozen times over the course of a, what's an hour-long movie. So you do get these moments that work. And I also am someone who, on set, if a scene does, if a line doesn't feel right to the actor, I, I'm like, well, don't say it. Say it how you would want to say it. I mean, let's get the idea across, if, if it makes sense. Um, we don't have necessarily, the words are not uh, Bond, you know. Uh, mm-hmm. And that was very much the nature of that movie. When I watched Mike Lee... I think I then saw things that appealed to my working method existing in the films and okay. in a, in a much, in Mike Lee, a much, much more powerful way. Let's be very clear. <laughs> a much more like these people. And we don't need movie... modesty here. Come on. You're, you're, you're Mike Lee level. Let's, let's, yeah. let's just get that out of the way. Yeah. Yeah. Six months of a uh, 40 hour week rehearsal for Turkey Bowl. People would, uh, I would never work again. Um, but I think there is something to, like, the movie's, his, the structure of his films is so um, unpredictable. And we were saying Topsy Turvy. It's an hour of, like, a kind of kind of standard biopic that's following two men and, and their relationship. And there's scenes that kind of develop. And then it becomes, like, let's make the Mikado. And then you have a 90-minute mm. or so sequence of 
but it's kind of plotless, but it's more enjoyable in many ways. But you, if you read the script as I did, or if you watch the movie, you're like, wait, why am I being pulled from scene to scene? And I think my belief is you're being pulled by like the um, sort of humanity that's on display, that the actors and the characters feel real, but they don't feel real in like a documentary way. And I, I, I've talked about this with some friends. I mean, there, there are these movies that are shot like documentary style or handheld or, and the, and the actors are non-actors who you're getting bits of the reality. And none of that's happening in Mike Lee. These are all trained professional actors. There's Dick Pope, a wonderful cinematographer, shooting them. There's top-notch technicians. And yet you're getting... And you never believe these people are, um, like, real. You don't think you're capturing reality. There's there's not a sense of... Um, it's not neorealism. The proscenium is a big part of the, uh, of, of the way the... The movie's presented. It's a great way to put it. And that's a great part about Topsy Turvy is like, we know we're watching a movie, but yet I still feel like I'm in on a life that I don't know. And, and a lot of his domestic mm. dramas, like, um, I think maybe his most overlooked movie is called All or Nothing, um, which has Timothy Spall, uh, Sally Hawkins, a very young James Corden, a very young and like quite obese James Corden. When is, is this from? 2002. Okay. So it's, it's actually his follow up to Topsy Turvy. He makes okay, this movie. but it, and this is for Vera da- Drake. Before Vera Drake, uh huh. Okay. And it's 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 set in a um, like a like a London project, like a, a sort of like housing, uh, public housing oh, situation. Brief aside, have you seen Career Girls? Because that seems like that follows up uh, um, Secrets and Lies. It, Secrets and Lies won the Palm, didn't it? Yes, it did. So uh, Career Girls follows that up, and no one seems to. Do it. That seems to be kind of a. Uh, no that, one brings that up. That film is really interesting. Um, it's he. It gets a lot of like my criticism on it is the criticism everyone has, which is it's a movie that has a lot of coincidence in it. Um, it's like mm. feels more plotted than his other movies. Uh, hmm. um, but it's really great. I mean, it's 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 set in two different time periods, and it has um, Catherine Cartledge, uh, who's in briefly Topsy Turvy. She's a naked, um, and it's 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 a it's kind of dual competing st- uh, different timelines working together and it feels like the slightest of his movies and maybe the most um, comedic. It's still, again, like even like lesser Lee is worth watching, but he does follow a little bit of the like Coen brothers track record of like make the big serious movie. And then like the goof, you Hmm. know? Okay. I I, I get it. I dig it. And I think what happened was, and I could be wrong on the timeline, but he also did the thing where he had capital after secrets and lies. So he made topsy turvy. It's like I will never, I will never have the ability to make a three-hour period film again. I just won the Palm. I got a bunch of Oscar nominations. Let's like blow the bank and make this, you know, movie that's probably gonna flop and not do mm-hmm. well. And and that's basically what happened. Um, yeah, in I reread Ebert's review of it. He made a big point about how uncharacteristic, but this is for a Mike Lee movie in in on paper, but actually it felt right. Just, and I, I forget his reasoning. It was something along the lines of the whole let's put on a show phenomenon is still in Mike Lee or, and the play roots, obviously. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's, uh, but I, I, we were talking about, um, I brought up all or nothing because of, uh, Oh yeah. But just, just the sense that like James, James Corden, who, who, who we, kn- we know we are young very and obese is what you said. <laughs> young and obese James Corden, uh, who we are so familiar with as this like performer, you know, late night, um, uh, internet star or whatever you would call him these days he gives like a wonderful guy yeah, he shits on his own performance in cats <laughs> yeah yeah that's right he's in cats uh which i haven't seen which is probably for the best um it's my he, one of my nieces uh my niece loved that movie so i watched the beginning it's kind of fun but I, I think i fell asleep uh mm. through no fault no fault of the film uh but he james corden is like wonderful in all or nothing He's, I think he's 23 or 24. He's and charming. He's obviously from the show. He's a charming guy. Charming guy. And, but it, the, the, there's something about um, how these actors connect with who they're playing. And I just, I think that is what I often respond to are these, the movies are, are driven by feeling and character more than plot almost always. And. Well, it's so funny because I, that, that comes across, but it's, it's, it's not done in a poetic form fashion it's done and like it comes from a, a stage idea where it's like let's get faces in a proscenium showing emotions like i mean that i guess that's the appeal i was talking about earlier with the louis ck thing with um like i want this idea of like good dramatists writing something and just like getting rid of all of the 
extra artifice and all the like uh, uh, frills of like making something look cinematic and just like show like the Bergman idea of like the the most powerful shot cinematic shot you're going to get is a close up of a face changing its mind you know or sorry that's mm-hmm. a David Thompson line but like just like good writing uh, uh, shooting faces going like and how people feel through something well yeah and there's there's a directness of like if you were to ask like what's a Mike Lee what's Mike Lee about? What's the entire oeuvre about? And I think it's like, oh, it's about like a lot of people say working class people. I don't I'm not sure that's true. I, I think it really is. He's like the one of the most humane filmmakers and that He's, it's like I saw that Renoir was a big influence of his too, on top which, of Ozu. The the famous yeah, the famous humanist. I mean it's it's um his central concern is portraying people and when he's done extremes, naked and happy go lucky they tend to um, galvanize people or attract people. But I think I like, I, I am often drawn to the more moderate things that are just showing kind of unremarkable people. I mean, a lot of these actors, mm. like Timothy Spall in Topsy Turvy, he's he's a famous actor in Victorian England, but no one knows who he is today. And for all intents and purposes, that's, an, that's a created character. But Timothy Spall is such a gifted actor and who who's inhabiting something beyond and again i might be imbuing this with my knowledge of mike lee and of timothy spall and all this other stuff but i do think there's a magic to the movies that is a result of the effort and the work that goes into them and i just i think i'm so fascinated by mike lee because i cannot understand how he does it i just the coen brothers or paul thomas anderson or quentin Tarrant, all, you know these kind of modern american I don't want to group them together because they're very different, but Mm -hmm. there's a way you can look at those films and understand the technique and understand the shot selection and understand the, the subtext and the way things are working together and um, sort of get to like, I, I can gather how you made this. And I, I do not understand how Mike Lee makes his movies. Well, what, one thing I, I, I noticed that is something that, you know, Amer- American film just isn't allowed to do that much, um, with a few exceptions, including our uh, former boss, uh, is m- developing these movies outside the page, like actually having a physical either actors or having shot something and discovering in the process after writing on the page. And like, like it, it, I mean, there's something to be s- said of like, developing a screenplay after rehearsal and seeing what this looks like, you know, actually put out there and, and, and three dimensional, you know, and, and like, does this work or does this work and developing it from there as opposed to writing a blueprint and hoping it works. Yeah. I mean, what's the, I, I can never get the line right. Cause I don't think I believe in it, but like <laughs> you, you can't make a, you, you can't make a good movie out of a bad script, right? Is that they say? Or I, I always get it wrong because I think you can. A script to me I, is. Yeah, I don't. I, I don't. I don't know if I. There's, there's with some. That, but. There's some. There's some line about this. And my problem is that a screenplay. I mean, there are wonderful, beautiful screenplays, and they make for great movies. But um, screenplays are not movies, right? They are. They are. They are. They are a different art form entirely. Yeah, and they really are. The the. And the translation of that by a director based on what someone else wrote or by a writer director is, um, is a really messy, complicated process. And a lot of people, I mean, f- I haven't seen Mank yet, but my understanding is it's Fincher's dad's screenplay. Mm-hmm. That Eric so, Roth, uh, did some polishing on. And who knows? I mean, Fincher's someone who I think really, uh, coordinates with the writer based on what he wants. And so it's sort of like ordering a- around. I-, I watched, um, Poltergeist this week for the first time in a long time and went deep into a hole on the authorship of that movie, which is obviously very rich. Um, uh, friends with a, um, um, my friend, uh, uh, AJ Gonzalez, uh, who's hopefully going to be on the show soon. Uh, he just, I just listened to his podcast recently where they did a, um, uh, they, they're doing a, uh, his podcast is called the director's wall and they're currently doing ones on Coppola and they just did an episode on Hammett about whether, um, Coppola actually directed that over Vim Vendors and Vim because you know there's two different versions of that movie and they went in a deep dive on Poltergeist and I just listened to that this week and I, I saw you on Letterbox that uh, you had seen Poltergeist this week which also we need to do go into your Letterbox is awesome man you're like you, <laughs> you, you, your commitment to Letterbox is something to is something to yeah 
this uh, this might potentially be a cut thing. You ready for this, Shane? You ready sure. to have your mind blown? Um, sure. This is a visual. That's why you can't really talk about it. Um, okay. I made a letterbox book. <laughs> this is 400 pages. On the phone. Yeah, this is 400 pages of all my reviews uh, up until 2019. How did you do that? I did it on, I mean, I'm psychotic. It was an idea I had, and then early in the pandemic, I was like, let's let's dive into this. And so I did it on Because you're, you're so committed to writing your reviews, and my whole thing is like, I don't want any of this shit in posterity. Yeah, I think, well, actually, part of making that book was to take it all off. So I think uh... my, my plan was like, okay, I'll have like a physical copy of it. It'll be like this thing I did for seven years. And then I might, I, I'll, remove, I'll leave like some of the really, you know, effusive ones up there. That's, you know, that's I'm not editing point. this out. I'm keeping this in. This is going to stay <laughs> in. Yeah. The book I have of my letterbox. Is, I mean, truly crazy. One person only audience, uh, me. And, uh, that's so cool. Yeah. But, um, Poltergeist, actually my Poltergeist review, I, I made some comment about like Spiel, I, I, the movie just looks and feels to me like a Spielberg movie. I know there's this whole thing with Toby Hooper, you know, directing it or whatever. Mm-hmm. Or obviously he's the credit of the director. They, um, they, on the episode, because I, I was on the vibe of like I, I I wanted to defend Toby Hooper, and um, that episode pretty thoroughly convinced me. Oh no, it's Spielberg. I mean, to me, it's like Toby Hooper might have actually directed it. He might have called action on every single shot of the movie, and maybe he offered. I'm sure he did stuff to create it, but the it's like the Selznick, Arthur Freed model of like the produce Jerry Bruckheimer, like the overall vision. It's so clearly Spielberg that to me it's a effectively a Spielberg movie. Um, but on the well, comments, there, there's just, those, I, I, I don't understand what the logic is. If, if Spielberg, what, what, what he has to gain by not putting his name on it as a director. I, yeah. I guess the argument is that he, uh, there was the strike and then he had ET, which came out the following week, which I, I don't think I realized that those films were so, you mentioned that in your letterbox review, I mentioned yeah. that. but did you see the comment on my letterbox review? No. So someone commented on it, who is like a poltergeist truther. Mm-hmm. And this person, I'm just assuming it's a man. That, that, that phrase, by the way, poltergeist truther is <laughs> we are living in bizarre fucking times. <laughs> well, this this person uh, has a whole Twitter page dedicated and on Letterbox as well to just sussing out people who say that Spielberg directed poltergeist and like shooting them down point okay. by point. Okay. Uh, and then the Twitter page is like all dedicated to uh, Toby Hooper made poltergeist and like you can't convince me otherwise. Fascinating stuff. Uh, I happy to defer and say Toby Hooper directed it. I don't care that much. But um, <laughs> I got but no, to, to get, I got no dog in this fight. <laughs> but to, but this comes up because, uh, yeah, it's like the 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 script and and the relationship between the script and the movie um, is difficult. And I think Mike Lee through this process makes the script and the film as organic as possible because I think the actors all know what they're going to be doing. There's little room for interpretation. I mean, Dick Pope talks a little bit about like the actors tend to know. I mean, they have to block it a little bit and they have to do the standard production stuff. But the actors, there's not a lot of questions being asked. There's not a lot of um, uncertainty on set. Well, especially from, by the time they get to shoot, like all this stuff has been sussed out in rehearsal. Yeah, they, and they've lived through it. And so it's it's a little bit, I think his shoots are fairly quick. Um, and they still look, I mean, his films have a very unfussy and striking visual style. Again, I mentioned that security guard scene in Naked because that's one of the few times I think he really leans into... Uh, a style that feels outside of like just the faces and mm, so much of topsy okay. turvy topsy turvy opens and closes with crane shots or definitely closes with one i can't remember if it cranes at the beginning there's a shot of the seats i don't know if it's the last shot is i know one of my favorite shots in the movie that i noted was um the scene where uh where the the plays first conceived there's this really cool push in tilt up it's a very dynamic shot of like the first time like creativity comes in the in the play is visualized the yes. is visualized that's that shot was notable and but so much of how he shoots the mikado and and all the uh gilbert and sullivan operas is um pretty simple but so rich and like again fixated on like I'm sure, I don't know, maybe I'm being, maybe I'm being too flowery here, but it's like, oh, if I was in the theater in the second row, this is like what it would have looked like, mm. you know? Um, that, that, this, was, um, that was Andre Brezin's uh, uh, theory on why uh, Orson Welles shot low angle shots because he, uh, Welles came from the theater and he thought about the first row. That's, at, yeah, I actually not thought about that. I think most of the shots in this, I just watched um, American Utopia, the uh, David Byrne. I, I started it. I haven't piece. finished it yet. The Spike Lee uh, one, yeah. Spike, yeah, and it's it's very good, um, but it's it's 
it's shot the nature of that performance is you want to be on stage with the uh with the performers that's like kind of how it is so it's it's mm. it's funny because it feels there's no low angle shots at all in the film there's, there's no part yeah, of yeah, yeah. The, no the, there's, there's a lot it's always seemed like eye eye level from what i saw love, yeah and there's no part that feels like i'm watching something whereas uh yeah whereas throughout throughout topsy turvy you are like watching the show you are watching the winding down um i so i watched this the day um with the, the big announcement of uh uh warner brothers saying that they're going to put their slate next year all out on to hbo max for a month uh, um, with theaters going in and um i don't want to do doom and gloom prophecy on sh- on anything like this but that did feel like a pretty significant day in film history of like depending on how the next next few years goes out theatrical but like of it, it could be as low case, uh, lowest case scenario like this is the multiplexes change but it did feel like there's a seismic shift in theatrical and film and just the film presentation and it was interesting watching this movie that day just because Gilbert and Sullivan probably were, you know, they, like up, uh, at the beginning of this, of this movie, they'd had 10 hits in a row, I think is mentioned in the movie. And so they probably were at the height of commerce in terms of art and commerce. And so it gave me this idea of like stories changing throughout the years. And like, like you mentioned earlier, this really wasn't that long ago. And it really put me in a headspace of thinking about, um, you know, some doomsday scenarios about what's going to happen to theatrical is that theatrical is going to be either um, higher end, more expensive, more spectacle, or uh, specialized and thought of like the way we think of theater right now. Um, like, I don't know. Did you did you have any of those kind of thoughts or anything like trying to like what is the state of storytelling? And, yeah. Uh, well, I went optimist with the Warner news. I, I took it as they need to drive a subscriber base ASAP to their platform. They don't have what they're all looking for, like their next Game of Thrones. So why not make it sign up to so watch Wonder Woman? I think Dune will. Uh, this is a bet. I'm willing, a low level bet. I'm willing to make. I'll buy you a beer, Shane. You want to take me on it? I don't think sure. Dune will come out on HBO Max exclu- uh, at the same time as Cinemas. Okay. I I, I, th- I, 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 there's a part of me that thinks they're going to have to adjust to, throughout the year. For, for they, this. they, they can't afford on a film of that size and with the, um, the sequel, right? They're making a Dune two. That's, or, or it's it's two halves of the of the story mm-hmm. or whatever. Um, I and I think that. That's slated for like a Thanksgiving release next year. So to me, it seems they did they did, was it Thanksgiving or did they move it to it was like September or something? If they moved it earlier, that might throw me off a little bit. I thought it was I I, I actually as I said this I really I don't know, but I know sure, it was sure. definitely next fall. Right, um, it is. Yeah, yeah, but um, I you know I I don't know. Obviously, I wish I knew, but I uh, what next November looks like. But I feel like we could be seeing movies by then, and that the trade off to having a sling stream versus being in theaters, I. I one thing I find interesting is these are these companies making these decisions based on based on the quality of the movies that they have. For example, I think Disney knew that Mulan was a bit of a turkey, and so they could stream that out, make a bunch of money quickly, and try to replicate opening weekend success. I get. I mean, they supposedly made more money than if they had put it out in theaters, but like their whole. I mean. Come on, all their remakes are like from a just basic critical reception are turkeys, but they make a lot of money. They make a lot of money. It's true. I just think there's a calculus that goes on that I cannot fathom about like what the global market looks like, what the investment of the movie is. And I, I also wonder if these companies had how much is in the pipeline. Like, do they have to release Wonder Woman now because there's just not enough room on the calendar? For their own productions, mega productions, and the mega productions everyone else had slowed down. Um, hmm. So, I, to me, I thought this seems uh, like this is like driving subscribers to HBO Max, and then hopefully 
God willing, films like Dune and The Matrix 4 and whatever do get a theatrical. Um, because I... But at the same time, like, Topsy Turvy is about a, a dead art form. Like, there aren't comic operas the way that Gilbert and Sullivan made them. I and mean, we still have comedies and we have musicals and Hamilton could even be said to be in the tradition. I mean, Hamilton is absolutely in the tradition mm. of what Gilbert and Sullivan started. But um, it's it's the dominant culture of the day, right? And despite all of the problems that Hollywood has had, films are still the dominant culture now. But it's it's right there with television. It's right there with streamers. And, and I guess the fear is that now... With the pandemic and people being home, things like the Queen's Gambit become this shared cultural experience rather than like, oh, we all saw Poltergeist. We all saw E.T. Mm. Now we're what all... is the water cooler event? Because, well, I was trying to remember real significant TV water cooler events of the last few years to, for the argument that the all adult storytelling is going to TV. And all I could really think of was the big finales like Sopranos or Breaking Bad finales. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I guess like the Red Wedding episode of Game of Thrones but I feel like that episode. Yeah. Oh, sh- well, that Game episode, of Thrones also had significant water cooler. That's a, that's a g- great example, actually. There's there's a few for that, especially I guess, last season. But I think what's interesting about the Red Wedding episode is that probably well, maybe the most famous episode. That was the episode that got people to watch Game of Thrones. Like I feel like when that episode happened, I wasn't watching the show, and everyone's like, "You need to start watching this." You know, <laughs> like I had like the serious, uh, like you should be catching up. But um. But that, that, that's the thing is Game of Thrones is a once a decade, maybe, you know, Breaking Bad, Sopranos. Those are not common um, shows. And everyone's trying to create those and, and have those. And so HBO Max, long way of saying, HBO Max hasn't had that yet. And I thought I thought the theatrical news was more like a big marketing ploy to get people to their streamer. That they and, might eventually abandon, though, as they, as the, 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 you know, the vaccine maybe starts to kick in or something. What will, what will be interesting is what happens to the, to the theatrical. A lot of things will be interesting, but what will happen to the theatrical window? Like, let's say, let's say next summer things are okay and Matrix Four comes out on I don't know June first. Um, do they put Matrix Four? Do they do two weeks in theaters and then June fifteenth it's on, you know, streams? Um, and you can, you know, I, I, that's that that's the calculus will be interesting. And obviously, theater chains will suffer from that if you don't have like li- long engagements of movies. Um, the, the, the theater chains in general are the biggest question marks. Like they are so, so many of them are so fucked. They're so, right yeah. I think like the Alamo draft houses and those places might be okay because they're specialty programming and because of their appeal to like local audiences. Um, but yeah, the bigger ones, I, I just, I doesn't look good. Right. <laughs> well, I'm thinking about our, our, the local art chain, like the around here is a family owned. It's been owned for like five generations and I don't know. I mean, I think they'll survive, but it, it it's rough. Um, yeah. yeah. It, it's just weird to think um, I haven't yeah, the, seen the movie. Like, how, when was the last movie you saw? First Cow. When was that? March. It was the it was the Friday before everything shut down. So Friday, like March 6th, 5th or 6th, mm. something like that. Which I think it's my favorite movie of the year. I love First <laughs> Cow. I don't know. Um, I haven't <laughs> seen it. Um, I think the last thing I was going to bring up, which may be odd just because, like, I never saw this play, but have you ever heard of a play by Anne Washburn called Mr. Burns? No. I have never seen it. I want to see it, because it, I, but I've read it multiple times because it is fascinating, but it's basically a post-apocalyptic play where um, it's three acts. Um, first act is after this unnamed apocalypse, it's these uh, people wondering in a group around a campfire trying to remember and recreate the uh, Cape Fear episode in of The Simpsons. And they're all trying to remember all the bits. And then the second act is five years after that. Sorry, spoiler alert. Spoiler alert for anyone who wants to see this play, which includes me. Um, they, uh, um, there's no electricity anymore, but like they've developed a civilization or a local civilization that is now recreating Simpsons episodes and uses uh, different TV episodes as a a bartering system of uh, currency. And then the real reason I brought this up, the last uh, act jumps forward 75 years in the future where everything deteriorates, but it shows what culture is like then. And it's a Gilbert and Sullivan uh, uh, musical sequence uh, based on what the remnants of what they wrote down the Cape of the Simpsons Cape Fear episode. 
So it's how they misremember it. It ends up being this like weird Joseph Campbell Jungian uh, idea of heroes and villains and power dynamics. And but in like uh, Mr. Burns is a devil character in it, and Homer is the hero. But it's this giant musical number based on an episode of The Simpsons, all done because of the vague Gilbert and Sullivan references in Cape Fear, the Cape Fear Simpsons episode. So it's it's like uh, I mean that sounds obviously incredible. It's like um, is it, is is in some way having read it, is it like a spoof of of religion and of like or of like where ideas come it's from? It's vague, like, not religion so much, but yeah, ideas it is just generally like archetypes and storytelling methods that are like if if a po- post if apocalypse happens, what would storytelling be for humans after afterwards and. I think that's my uh, follow up to the idea of uh, topsy turvy is a hundred years in the past. This would be Gilbert and Sullivan a hundred years in the future. So, well, and sorry, there's a lot of ideas and I feel like, I feel like I got to go off tr- a track here. Maybe because there's so many ideas involved. We did not talk a lot about the text of the movie, but the, the idea that a text, I mean, it sounds like that thing is about like a, how a foundational text can evolve over time and a belief system can emerge or whatever. Mm-hmm. But it's also about like the death of, um, I don't know. I mean, oh shit! I, I really should have made a list of like films about like dying arts. I just <laughs> threw a lot at you. Well, I know, what I, I, but it's, and I'm not smart enough to like parse it all out. But, but like, you're not smart enough to parse out a play you haven't read or seen. <laughs> but no, but this idea, this idea, it's like, you triggered a bunch of things. And one was, okay, like right now we're looking at like the death of. Um, we're dealing with the death of journalism and like local journalism and we're dealing with the death of print newspapers. And so now you watch a film like all the president's men and it feels like ancient history. Um, But what's the movie, what's the movie about the death of modern print journalism? And um, you know, this, I mean, I I think that just speaks to like the uh, uh, epic amount of change that's happening technologically and, and just the rate of it increasing. So and well, all and, these institutions are dealing with this right now. Yeah, I, I, for some reason, Singing in the Rain just popped, came to mind. Because that's a movie about the death of the silent yeah. film in some way, right? And it's like, yeah. the remove there is, what, 25 years? And Lee's making this basically 100 years after the death of this Victorian comic opera. Um, I don't know. I, I, I'm sort of throwing ideas out because it's... Like, if the movies are to die, which I know you and I do not want to happen. I And I, to be fair, I don't 100% think it's, I mean, it's 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 still like a century or, or a while away, so. Well, it, it, the thing, it's the, the thing the, we fear and talk about. That's the reason I'm bringing it up. Yeah, and, and I guess the, the thing to think about is what could replace it. That, is there something that could replace it that could be better? And for me, I, I don't know. I think that the, the consistent line from Gilbert and Sullivan to the movie theater is that you're with other people. And what this year has been about is that we're not with other people. We're with like the one or two people we can quarantine with watching things on our television while our phones are buzzing. And like other than uh, theatrical plays, musicals or the movie theater um, or like a concert, there's not this like shared um, experience. And so I get optimistic when I think about how people are, are craving that and that movies can survive. But I, you know, the, the nuances, the multiplexes, the art houses, like, that's going to be a thing. And it's, I don't know. I was, I was, I was talking to a friend last night about the movie Hocus Pocus, uh, the, the Disney <laughs> um, witches movie. Yeah. If you watch that movie, it's really weird and sl- kind of sloppy. And there's like these, there's like these weird jokes in it, like some sort of like sexy jokes that, and it just was like, whoa, this is a Disney that's not that long ago, but they're not, um, they're not, a, they're not, they're a mega corporation, but they're not Disney of now. And it wasn't, you know, it was 25 years They're not ago. the monolithic Disney of now where everything has been uh, workshopped and edited out and, you know, um, uh, there are, whatever. It, it just was, it, it was interesting to think about how the world right now can change again. Like Marvel and Disney may pass. Maybe we'll see a return to people wanting to go see um, small family dramas. Maybe Mike Lee will make a, a hit movie. I got to Ooh, I, I did kind of also want to end on, um, uh, did you see Mike Lee supposedly was going to maybe shoot a movie this summer, this last summer? No, I was just looking him up. I hadn't seen anything about what he was working on. What's... I didn't get any details of it, but I, I assume that maybe it's just him committing to a five to six month process of rehearsal before shaping something that he might or might not want to shoot. His, I think my least favorite film of his, 
of this of the late period is um, his last film, Peterloo, which is easily his biggest budget movie. Amazon financed it, um, and it's even though it, even though it, it's it's not that I didn't like it that much. I have it's, it has stuck with me, and it's a movie about. Um, there's a lot of speeches in it. There's like people. It's like it's sort of about like the power really? of language. Yeah, it's it's okay. really. I think it's better than I thought it was when I watched it, and I'm sort of afraid to revisit it because I think I'm, I'm who knows. Uh, it was a tough watch um, at the time, but it's about the Peterloo massacre that happened in Manchester, which is where Lee's from, uh, which I didn't know anything about. But um, it's just a lot of speeches and whatnot, and it it was funny because it felt like topsy turvy, another like. In, in this conversation we're having, and this is, I know people have this point a million times, but like David Fincher just got a blank check to make Mank. Martin Scorsese got a blank check to make The Irishman. Mike Lee got a version of a blank check to make Peterloo, which is almost an experimental movie in terms of how it treats <laughs> traditional plot and narrative. So these filmmakers are still pushing the envelope with these different finances, but whether or not those films are being seen or having an impact is harder to ascertain. Um, I mean, in our world, Mank will be like, everyone's talking about Mank, but I don't know if that breaks through to like the larger cultural conversation. Um, anyway. No, yeah, that's a good point. The larger cultural conversation is kind of the benchmark I'm thinking of, I guess. Like, I think I think Irishman got there a little bit, but I don't think, I don't know. I don't know how much people care about uh, David Fincher films. Um, but Peter Liu, being what it was, I thought, oh, Lee's due to return to a human drama that after he's done two straight period films with Mr. Turner and Peter Lou, he, my guess would be, he goes back to like his bread and butter. Okay. Um, so who knows? Hopefully that hopefully turns out great. Did you have any uh, last thoughts on topsy turvy? Uh, I, let's see here. Uh, yeah, I, I had notes. We basically hit all of them. There's, there's a long quote. I'll read, I'll just read this quote. Maybe you can find a place for this. Uh, this is a quote from Lee from Mike Lee and Mike Lee where he says, quote, I have three thoughts about the motivation of topsy turvy. One, above all, Gilbert and Sullivan would allow me to take on the apparent genres of the biopic and the lavish, cost- lavish costume drama without any risk of losing the very core of my films, which is character. Two, there's no way I would have considered this if it were merely to, merely to deal with Gilbert and Sullivan. It could only make sense if it was about something important to me, over and above them and their shows. It was time to turn the camera around and look at what we all do. I felt Topsy Turvy would be an excellent device for exploring matters to do with those of us who are in the business of creating entertainment. Of course, I could make a film about filmmakers, but for whatever reason, I don't really fancy it. Three, having read extensively about this world, deciding to make a film about it was the next best thing to getting into a time travel machine to go back and see what it was like. I think we did that in the way. Uh, That was certainly part of the buzz of it. It's a buzz I get anyway when a film starts to come together and a reality begins to exist. So that kind of, I mean, we talked about all those things, but if you want to... No, I think that's a great summation. Yeah, it seems like a nice uh, nice way. I mean, it's good to hear him talk about it, the things you feel about a movie, and it's kind of nice to hear the author say, don't worry, that was what I, that's what I intended. You nailed it. Um, Kyle Smith, thank you so much for being on this. You got to come back, man. Like, you got to pick some more movies to talk about. This is great. And, like, yeah, uh, there's more to talk about. Yeah, Shane, I love it. Thanks for letting me ramble on there, and, and uh, I hope everyone who's listening... If you haven't seen Topsy Turvy, it's worth just settling in and just like living in it for a couple hours. It's well worth it. I I, I think the point you made to me earlier on is that it's, uh, it's something that uh, changes with multiple viewings, so I'm going to have to revisit it again. Yeah, so. yeah it's worth it. Yeah.